Happy Wisdom Wednesday, everyone. So this week, I have an incredibly controversial book for you. Very provocative, but it's gonna give you a fantastic history, not only of business, but an idea of really how the world works. So the book of the week was written back in 1928, but don't let that fool you on the power and the value in this book, and it's called Propaganda by Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was considered the father of public relations. See, Edward Bernays, before 1928, when he wrote this book, he worked under President Calvin Coolidge under the arm of the, or the branch of the US government called the US Committee for Public Information, otherwise known as the CPI. The CPI was a propaganda machine. It's what put out the advertisements and the propaganda to encourage the American people to embrace going to war because that was our one hope to save and protect our freedom and democracy. The same model has been used for many future worlds, wars to come after that. And what Edward Bernays observed was that propaganda was incredibly effective during wartime. And he was so moved and frightened, of course, from the idea of totalitarian, totalitarians and communists you know, possibly taking hold of the public and encouraging them that he thought, well, if propaganda works so well in, in wartime, it definitely will help during peacetime, and more importantly, to help mold and influence the mind of the public so that we can protect our, you know, our freedom, make sure that capitalism and democracy is well, and that things like totalitarian governments don't take over. And he says this very, uh, very interesting quote that many of you may have heard. That quote is this, is that we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes form, our ideas suggested largely by men we've never heard of. Now, throughout the book in Propaganda, Edward Bernays not only addresses the use of it, but he also talks about how to do it surprisingly in an ethical manner, in an authentic manner. And he, he really stresses that, that businesses have a responsibility to the public to tell the truth, to explain what they're doing and why. But he saw propaganda as a way, not necessarily to you know, do a Pavlovian trick to people, which he felt was the old propagandist way, which is you do things through a repetitive manner and eventually people will, very much like Pavlov's dog, accept an idea. His thoughts was you have to understand the group dynamics. What are their impulses? What are their habits? What are their desires? Who are the leaders in the group? And how do you change the circumstances so that they can adopt something? A great example is the idea of the music room. When he wanted to help sell more pianos, he didn't try and just shove the ideas of piano down the face of people. He started to talk to architects and figure out ways of how do we make the idea of a music parlor in the home an accepted idea, and then that's how you can sell more pianos. One famous campaign that Eddie Bernays ran was Torches of Freedom for uh, a cigarette company, which has completely slipped my mind. But the idea was back in that time, it was very provocative for women to be smoking cigarettes. So what Eddie Bernays thought to do was, well, if we wanna sell more cigarettes, we have to understand what the cigarettes mean to women. And when he got a psychologist, he f they found out that what the cigarette mean was uh, to women was it was, a, uh, it was a form of authority. And in a sense, it was giving women their own penis, right? It was a phallic symbol. So understanding that, Eddie Bernays segmented the audience. He got a group of beautiful uh, debutantes and, and models to go down to Vogue in New York City and smoke cigarettes. And he alerted the media to say, hey, there are gonna be women down at Vogue smoking cigarettes and they're gonna be uh, ripping off the chains of enslavement and smoking torches of freedom. Right? And this was a big campaign around liberty. So he used specific words and images that really in, 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 induced the sort of uh, acceptance of this idea. And that's how a lot of cigarettes were made. And when you look through history, there are so many things that Edward Bernays touched. He had uh, uh, customers like Procter & Gamble, General Modal, Motors, um, and a, a few other companies I can't, can't seem to think of, but it's all connected. now. What's interesting about this is that Edward Bernays was actually quite influenced by things like this. This is uh, Civilization and Discontent by Sigmund Freud. And it's more than just him picking up a book and reading. You see, Edward Bernays was actually Sigmund Freud's nephew. 
See, Sigmund Freud, you know, after one of the after the war, was on the verge of bankruptcy, and Edward Bernays, being his favorite nephew, actually helped his uncle publish some of his works to make money. So Eddie Bernays was very much influenced by this idea of psychology, and he felt that human beings were driven by animalistic primal desires and emotions and impulses, and that through business and through the use, the proper use of propaganda back then, that you could sell those proper desires, influence people on how they should embrace life and how should they should live life, and that way it could protect the democracy and capitalism that we lived in. Right Now, some of you may disagree with a lot of things that he did, and I definitely do, but it's important to understand not only the history behind this, but how these things work. One of the most important things that I got out of this book was the idea of studying and understanding the audience. And a lot of marketers and people in PR, they focus too much on what the individual is going to be interested in. The problem with focusing on individuals is that every individual is going to be different. That's why they're individuals. However, when you study a crowd of people, the crowd has its own psychology, its own ideas. And when a crowd has its own psychology, it focuses mainly on these three areas. Number one, it goes to impulses. And based on those impulses, it looks to its leaders to make a decision. After that, it goes to habits. Habits such as key terms, words, jargon that, that are used, things that that resonate with them. And the last part is emotion. And that's when um, those kind of words trigger emotions that move you into action. And one last thing that I want to mind loom into this, because it relates to, again, how, how marketing, public relations, propaganda, politics, all these things are, are intertwined, especially here in the US, is Scott Adams' fantastic book, Win Bigly. So in Win Bigly, Scott Adams talks about how essentially Donald Trump won the presidency because Scott Adams predicted that two years uh, ahead of time, and he was he was right about everything. Now Scott Adams is a trained hypnotist, and he's also uh, very well uh, trained in persuasion. And when he ranks the things that are most persuasive to the least persuasive, here are the top three: number one, big fear; number two, identity; and number three small fear. So if you think about how propaganda works, or at least the kind of propaganda that you're thinking about, because many of you, when you hear propaganda, you're just thinking of the bad things. Think about the kind of things that influence you, let's say, a charity, right? But that's still propaganda. Now the idea of propaganda is you focus, main, you know, you focus on identity. Right? What's, what are the people going to resonate most, most with? And how do you change those circumstances around those different ideas and identity forms to force them into action? So, fantastic book. It's only 150 pages long. You have to read and understand this, whether you're in business or politics, but you have to appreciate where we've come from and more importantly, how things still work today. So. That's the book of the week. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week.